-hmm. All right, John chapter number 15. Very famous section of, of Scripture right here in the beginning. Also, a very, very misunderstood portion of Scripture in these first, oh, I don't know, about eight verses here, talking about Jesus being the vine and God's the husbandman. And we're going to go over this parable real quick. Um, I'm not going to reread it. We just read the whole thing. But through verses 1 through 8, we're going to go back and we're kind of going to go through this whole chunk of Scripture. It's obviously a parable. There's no doubt about that. He's talking about a vine. He's talking about fruit. And, um, you know, he doesn't have to explain that this is a parable. We know that it's a parable. Now, one thing I want to point out, as with any parable in the entire Bible, you got to be careful not to form an entire doctrine just based on one parable or a couple parables. Our doctrine needs to come from very clear scripture. Now, we, it doesn't mean you can't learn or, or get more truth or knowledge out of parables. They're great. Jesus used it all the time. But they're examples. And oftentimes, see, what, what, one of the mistakes people make with parables is that you start to make more applications than the intended purpose for a parable. So um, I'll give you a good example of this. When, when, when we try to explain salvation to people, and you explain that salvation is a free gift, right? And there's a lot of aspects of that analogy or of that parable of explaining that something's a free gift. And it's a good example to use because it's in the Bible. The Bible says the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Which is why we use that parable to begin with, is it stems from God's Word. So it's a good parable to use, but you can't just look at every single possible thing you can do with a gift and just say it's all applicable. It has to line up with Scripture. So, for example, right, we use the example of, of a gift because, one, it's free for the person receiving it. The person who, who, who is giving it actually had to pay for it. They're the ones that, that bought it, but they give it away for free. And if, it, if you have to pay anything for it or do work or do anything else, it's no longer a gift by definition. That's a, that's a great explanation and, and use of, of the parable of, of explaining salvation as a free gift. It's not of our works. It's not how good we are. Um, it's free. And God's gift is eternal life. It means it lasts forever. Those are all good things. And these are things that we use when we go over it. But a lot of times what people say is, and you ask them, well, you kind of go through salvation a little bit more. And you ask if they could ever lose it. And will people say, well, yeah, I mean, like with a gift, you could give that gift away to someone else or you can throw it away and like not want it anymore. Well, every parable at some point is going to fall apart. It's not like intrinsically every single aspect of what you can do in a, in a given story lines up with biblical truth. Now, there's tons of great truth illustrated in the example of a gift. But that's not it doesn't mean you can take every single possible thing you can do with a gift and say, well, then everything applies about salvation to my understanding of a gift. No, it's, it doesn't work that way. The, the reason for a parable is to help you to understand a greater truth, not to define the truth itself. Does that make sense? So if you were to say salvation is a gift and that's the only way to understand it and all the truth has to derive from my understanding of a gift. No, that's not how it works. It's, it's the opposite. It's this is the truth. You have salvation. You have eternal life. Here's something to help you understand it. You could, it's kind of like a gift. It's kind of like being born. You're being born again. You know, these are, these are illustrations. And, you know, being born again is a better illustration to, to understand the eternal security aspect of it. Maybe than, than a gift would be. But, um... But every, every parable you give it serves a purpose. You're trying to drive home a specific point about whatever truth you're teaching. right? The gift is, is mostly you, you're, you're just trying to express how the freeness of it, the, the, the fact that it doesn't require work. Um, that is the whole goal and purpose of using that illustration of a gift. Um, so in this passage in John 15, that, all that being said, there's one main point that's being driven home with this parable. And the, and the main point, I'll tell you right now, as we go through this, it's bearing fruit. It's bringing forth fruit. That's the whole point. He brings it up over and over again about bring, bringing fruit, abiding in Christ, and that's how you bring forth fruit. Um, a lot of people will mistake this and, and try, to, try to use this portion of Scripture to say, well, this is talking about salvation and how you can lose your salvation if you're not, you know, if you no longer are in Christ, 
then you can lose your salvation and you'll go to hell. It doesn't say that anywhere in here. It doesn't say that this is talking about salvation. Now, um, salvation is linked with this, but it's not the whole point or goal of this parable. The whole goal of this parable, the whole point is, is to explain bringing forth fruit. Um, so just a brief overview of this parable, and then we'll get into it. You have a husbandman, which is God. You've got the vine, which is Jesus, and then you have branches, right? And um, I actually have this little illustration to help us just visualize what, you know, it's real simple, right? We've probably seen this before. So you've got your vine, your main portion, your vine is rooted into the ground. And then the vine has a bunch of branches, and some of those branches are bringing forth fruit. Like here, we've got grapes, right? So, but not every branch that's in that vine is bringing forth fruit. Some of them will and some of them won't. But if you take any of those branches off, it's impossible for them to bear fruit, right? There's no way they're going to bear fruit anymore. They have to, they get their life, they get their nutrition, they get everything from the vine. The vine gets it from the roots right in the ground. Well, in this parable, Jesus Christ is the vine. And basically what he's saying is that in order to produce fruit, you've got to be in, in first of all, you've got to be in that vine of Jesus because you can't do it without him. If you're just some branch and you're just, you're not part of the vine and you're just off somewhere, you're not going to be producing fruit. Um, you need, it needs to come from Jesus. Jesus is the one that gives us that power. But um, you can be in this, this part of the, in the vine and still not produce fruit, right? So and that's where the salvation aspect would come in is that not every saved person, not every believer brings forth fruit, um, but they're part of the vine. Now, um, just, this is just to give you that, that illustration as we, as we dig into this, because again, the purpose of, of a parable is to use something that people are very familiar with. We're familiar with receiving gifts. We're familiar with, with childbirth. We're familiar, uh, not as much anymore these days, but um, <laughs> all the way up until recent times, people were generally familiar with vine dressing and husbandry and these other agricultural types of um, illustrations that the Bible uses quite a bit of. Um, it's, it's been very common knowledge up until just recently with these mega cities and, and, and the manufacturing and industry and people living their life without even knowing real, real simple concepts about how things work just in nature itself. But, um, but they are simple concepts and the reason why they're given is, is because of the simplicity of it and the ease for us to be able to understand this. He's driving home a truth. So. Basically, again, the parable, we've got a husband in, we've got the vine, we've got branches, and he says, you know, if a branch doesn't bear fruit, it's going to be taken away. And like in this illustration, why would a branch be taken away? Well, because your whole goal of having a vine is to produce fruit. I mean, that's why you have it. That's why we have, you know, our apple trees and peach trees, and we've got vines growing in the back. The reason why we have them is to produce fruit. That's what we want from it. We're trying to get something out of it. And... If you have branches that are basically useless, well, the whole, what he's saying here is that you're going you're gonna to take those away because what you want to have happen is have another branch grow in its place that is going to produce fruit. You don't want something just wasting space and taking up room and maybe stealing nutrition and, 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 and other nutrients from a branch that's going to be producing the fruit. You're going to do the best, the, you're going to try to maximize that fruit that you're getting already. And is it, just understand the physical aspect of this. This is what he's talking, talking about, right? Um, and then if a branch bears fruit in this parable, it's saying that it's going to be purged, that it could bring forth even more fruit. Um, you know, there's, there's tree trimming. You want to get rid of all the dead branches. When, when you do that type of purging and, um, and clearing of the trees, that'll, that'll actually help them to become more fruitful and more abundant. Uh, it's, just, it's just the way that this stuff works. It's very simple to understand. Um, and then obviously if a branch is removed from the vine, I went over this earlier, it's not going to be able to bring forth fruit. So when you take away a branch, it's, it's no longer going to be capable of, bear, of bearing fruit because it's no longer part of the life of the, of the vine. So it's a very simple illustration, but unfortunately, as I said, there's a lot of people that don't understand this parable and they've come up with all kinds of different false doctrines about it. And most of it has to do with the work salvation. Now, Proving work salvation false is very easy to do with a whole host of scriptures that I'm not going to spend the time in doing on this sermon. We've done it so many times before. 
I don't feel like that's going to do us any good. We're, we're, we need to study this chapter more in depth and just go into the true, simple meaning of this passage. And, and once you understand this, if, if this has ever given you a problem before, just seeing how simple this, this message really is, hopefully it will clear up any, any doubt or any confusion that's been brought about by people who believe in false doctrines such as workspace salvation, losing your salvation, and, th and that type of thing. Now, the whole focus, as I said earlier, is about bearing fruit. So let's go back through this parable. And verse 8 actually holds the key. Verse 8 is kind of the last verse in this, in this parable. And it's the key to understanding this concept we're going to go over. Verse 8 says, Herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. So he says, if you're bearing much fruit, right, that's when you're going to be considered one of Jesus' disciples. Is that not what he just said? He says, herein is my Father glorified that ye bear much fruit, semicolon, so shall ye be my disciples. Now, let me ask you this. Is every single believer on Jesus Christ, is every single believer a disciple of Jesus Christ? No, and we'll see why not. Turn, if you would, real quick to Luke 14, because we're going to see how Jesus actually defines a disciple. He defines a disciple in Luke 14. This is important to understanding what this parable is talking about, because the whole thing is talking about bearing fruit, and he says, if you bear much fruit, then you are his disciples. That's, you are a disciple of Jesus Christ. If you're bearing fruit, you're a disciple of Jesus Christ. Luke 14, look at verse number 26. Jesus said, if any man come to me, and hate not his father and mother, and wife, and children, and brethren, and sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Jump down to verse 33. He says, So likewise, whosoever he be of you, that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. So, if, you're trying, if someone's going to try to tell you that being Jesus' disciple is the same as being saved, does that mean that a person has to forsake everything that they have? That they have to hate their father, hate their mother, hate their wife, hate their children, and they also have to bear their cross in order to be saved? Are all of those things necessary in order for a person's soul to be saved? Absolutely not. The Bible says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. It doesn't say you have to do all of these good works. Now, are these all good things to do? Of course they are. That's how you become Jesus' disciple. Because being Jesus' disciple is someone who's following and listening and obeying and doing the things that Jesus wants you to do. That's when you become his disciple. When you're able to, to forsake all that you have and say, you know what? I'm done with all this worldly stuff, Jesus. I'm just going to follow you with my life. I'm going to do good works for you, Jesus. That's when you're his disciple. And when you do that, guess what you're going to be doing? You're going to be bearing much fruit. Just like Jesus Christ said unto, his, unto the disciples, he said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. That's a promise. If you follow Jesus, he will make you into a fisher of men. If you, are, if you follow Jesus, if you become his disciples, you will be fruitful. That is, that is a foregone conclusion of being a disciple of Jesus Christ. It matches up perfectly here. But being his disciple does not, you don't have to be his disciple to be saved. You have to be saved to be his disciple, but you don't have to be his disciple to be saved. They're two different things. So this is very important to understand when we go through this parable. Now, what happens if a person stops following Jesus? Right? Right? He says, if you follow me, I'll make you fishers of men. And, and if you're, you're his disciple, you're going to be doing his things, you'll be forsaken, you know, forsaken everything that you have. What happens if you stop doing that? Do you all of a sudden just lose your salvation? No, of course not. That's silly. Some people might say that you were never really saved to begin with. Right? I've heard that before. They'll say, oh, well, you know, if you don't endure to the end, that's just proof that you were never saved. But that's nonsense because if you were never saved to begin with, then you weren't really his disciple. And we're going to turn, if you would, to John chapter 6. Turn, flip over to John chapter 6. I want you to see this. And people might say, well, what do you mean if you're not saved, you're not a disciple? What about Judas? Judas is one of Jesus' disciples, right? Well, Judas was called a disciple. That's true. But it's because he was an inf infiltrator. It's because nobody knew that he was wicked. Nobody knew that he really didn't believe, that he really wasn't a follower of Jesus Christ. He was a disciple on the outside. 
but he was not a true disciple of Jesus Christ. The Bible says that he was a devil from the beginning. So you can't say that Judas was a true disciple. Yeah, he was, he was one of the twelve for a specific purpose, that, that he because he was the traitor that was going to betray Jesus Christ in order to fulfill his prophecy. But he was not a true disciple of Jesus Christ. A true disciple of Jesus Christ um, believes on him and follows him. Judas did not believe. He followed him, but he didn't believe. And even the following wasn't really done right because he was a thief, the Bible says. He, he, wanted, he stole the money that was in the bag. He was a treasure. He took care of the money and he stole that money. He was a thief. So he wasn't even following Jesus in that way. He was a wicked, wicked man. He was a devil. But, um, and devils are not disciples of Jesus. Just in case you didn't know, Jesus said he was a devil from the beginning. A devil is not a disciple of Jesus Christ. That's really bizarre if you're going to hold to that doctrine. Um, John 6, look at verse 66. The Bible says, from that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. So is it possible for a disciple, a true disciple, to stop following Jesus? Of course it is. It says so right here. The Bible talks about people who were Jesus' disciples, but when, when Jesus started saying things that, that they thought might be offensive or they didn't quite understand, they stopped following him. And um, now what's going to happen to those to those disciples that stop following. Guess what happens? They stop being fruitful. They're no longer going to be fishers of men. When they stop to cease to follow them, you know, faith without works is dead. So when they stop doing the works, when they stop following Jesus, their faith is going to die and they're going to be unfruitful. But that has nothing to do with their eternal salvation. They'd already been saved the moment they put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Doing the works is completely separate from that. So, and he says this in his parable. Look at verse number 2 of, of John 15. Go back to John 15. We're gonna, now we're going to go through line by line in his parable. Verse 1, he explains that he's the vine and God the Father is the husbandman. Verse 2, he says, Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. So, right there we see the same thing, that if you're not bearing fruit, well, in this parable, it's a vine, and it's going to take it away. You're not going to be bringing forth any more fruit then, because you're going to be taken away. And he says, notice this though, because it says in verse 2, every branch in me. So this is someone who's already in Christ. They already have Christ. They're already a part of that vine. They've already been saved. They're a branch in me, but they're, they're bearing not fruit. So again, people like to say, oh, well, a Christian will always bear fruit. They'll say, it has to. If you see someone and they're not bearing fruit, they're not bringing forth, then they're not saved. Well, Jesus said, every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. So it's possible for there to be a branch that's in Christ that's not bearing fruit. It happens, my friends, because salvation is believing on Jesus Christ. It is not doing the works and bringing forth fruit. And see, another thing that people get confused about, and we're going to get into this a little bit later, is, is um, what is fruit? And I'll explain real briefly. I've explained it in other sermons in the past. But fruit, in every physical, real-world example that we have of fruit, it's reproducing after its own kind. That is what fruit is. Fruit is an apple tree brings forth apples. And that's always what it brings forth. It's always going to bring forth apples because that is what it is. That's what it's part of. It's part of that apple tree. The apple tree brings forth fruit. What's that fruit going to bring forth? Another apple tree, which brings forth more apples. And it's just a reproduction of itself. All throughout the Bible, that's what fruit is. Or physically, talking about with children, Again, it's, it's a multiplication of yourself. It's the same exact definition. It's the same exact thing. When you're bearing fruit physically, as my wife has borne fruit in children, in childbearing, we've multiplied. Our family is growing. And the more children that we have, it's a reproduction of other human beings, other people, because that's what we are. We're people. We're human beings. We bring forth others after our own kind. So with Christians... Guess what? That definition doesn't change. Bringing forth that fruit is bringing forth other Christians, getting people saved, getting people converted, leading them to Christ. When a person believes on Jesus Christ as a result of your efforts, you showing them the gospel, that's you bringing forth your fruit and reproducing 
Christ in them um, because you have Christ in you. And obviously the power is coming from him, but using you to do that work. Um, that's where it's coming from. That is what the fruit is. And people say, oh, but what about the fruit of the Spirit? Well, that's the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, gentleness, goodness, faith, you know, all these things. They're, they're, that's fruit of the Spirit. But that's not necessarily fruit of the Christian. That's, that's, that's God's Spirit gives those things, and that's the fruit that that Spirit will produce. But um, the fruit of the Christian is other Christians. So um, it's that there's kind of a couple things that people get, get confused about. But it's, it's actually a very simple, it just makes perfect sense when you're using parables. I mean, take it in its simplest form. You've got a vine, it bears fruit, you know. When you have a plant that's not doing what you want it to do by bearing fruit, you're going you're gonna to do things to make it do what you want it to do, to bear fruit, right? Whether it mean, if it means taking away branches, doing all those other things, that's what it's talking about. And the focus on here is, is about a Christian bearing fruit. So, um, so we saw verse 2, if you're bringing forth fruit, God really likes that. And he sees that, so what he's going to do, he's going to begin to purge you so that you can bring forth more fruit. Now, the purging process, you know, think about in a, in a plant, you're going to be snipping away at, at, at different areas to, to make that fruit really grow and grow more abundantly. Well, that's what God does in our life. When he sees you, new Christian, start to go out, or old Christian, but you start to go out and actually become fruitful, that's when you're going to see the real changes in your life start to happen. You can go to church. I've known people, you know, you go to church for a really long time, but never go out soul winning, never really bear fruit, right? You're never really giving the gospel to people, but people go to church for a really long time. Generally speaking, your life, the lives are, are, pretty, are pretty static. They're pretty, you know, they're on that, that plane, that plateau, wherever they're at in their spiritual growth. But when you start to bring forth fruit and you start to do what God, what, what, what God wants you to do and start living the way He wants you and, and actually bring forth fruit, God sees that and guess what he's going to start doing? He's going to start purging you. He's going to start snipping away at, at, at areas of your life that are no good for you. The sinful areas of your life that are holding you back from really producing a lot for God, God's going to be working on that with you. And you always see the most spiritual growth in a person when they start going soul winning and they start being fruitful because God sees that and as a, as a husbandman, he wants you to do more and to bring forth more fruit. And um, it, it, it truly is an amazing thing. So if you want to get sin out of your life, the number one thing, the best way you can, you can help yourself is by going out and winning souls. God will help you get that sin out of your life because he's going to start to purge you. You'll, and, and you know what? It doesn't always feel pleasant to get purged. It, it, it might sting a little bit. Getting snipped here, snipped there, getting some of that, that old sinful flesh off of you. Getting, getting that spots off of you. But it's needful because it will then help you to, to become even more fruitful. And, um, and that's the whole goal, and that's what he wants us to do. So, you know, God likes to see that, and he's going to focus, and he's going to focus and pay more attention to you, too. These dead branches, just, let's get rid of those. We don't need that. I want to focus on this. Hey, this is where the action is. This is where the fruit's coming from. You want God blessing your life? Win souls. Be someone who's going to be fruitful for God. Hey, he's going to look down on that and bless that and, and bless you for doing that. Because that's, that's the main objective for a Christian in this lifetime is to, is to reproduce and to bring forth fruit. Now, um, look at verse number three. He says, Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Again, it's God's word that cleanses you. It's God's word that saves you. And he says, you're clean. You're clean by the word. And this is kind of, um, that's the salvation aspect of this parable. It's not, it's not, you know, necessarily, it's not, it's not like um, you're going to lose that salvation anyway. It's, it's, it's the word that has already cleansed you. But look at verse number, and being clean um, is what you need to be to be saved. Now, if you're not bearing fruit, it doesn't mean you're not clean. It just means you're not bearing fruit. Look at verse number four. The Bible says, Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye, except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, ye can do nothing. 
Now, again, we're powerless without Christ. If we're doing anything of our own power, of our own abilities, of our own strength, it's not going to come in. We're not going to have the, the power of Christ. We need, we need the power of Christ to, um, to be able to bring forth fruit. I can't get somebody saved at the door through my own logic, through my own reasoning, through my own skills, through my own persuasiveness. No. I need to have Christ in me in order to bring forth that spiritual fruit. I need the Spirit in order for the Spirit to be born in somebody else. I cannot, I do not wield that power of my own accord, of my flesh. I need Christ to, to, to be with me in order to give me that strength, to give me that power for that person to become born again. And um, that's what he's saying is that you can't do anything without me. You need to be abiding in Christ. You need to be, you know, walking in his steps and, and, and living and abiding in him in order to be fruitful. And that's why he says in verse 5, he that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. Now we saw at the end of this, at the end of this parable that if you bear much fruit, you're his disciples. So what he's talking about abiding in him, he's talking about living and walking and doing the way that he wants us to do. It's a, it's a, it's a walk with God. It's not have you ever received Christ as your Savior like for salvation. It's are you walking with him and doing the things that he wants you to do and following him and being his disciple? Because if you are, then you're going to bring forth much fruit. That's why he says, if you abide, he that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. So when you're abiding in him, you will. You're going to be his disciple. These things are all equivalent here. The, the bringing forth fruit, being a disciple and abiding in Christ in this parable. All talking about works and all talking about doing the right thing, not talking about salvation. And notice... There's one verse here, and it's verse 6. We'll just read it real quick. It says, If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered, and men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. Now, nowhere in this, in this text is it really talking about, I mean, there's no clear verse saying anything about eternal life or salvation or everlasting life or anything like that in this entire parable. Nowhere. And this is the one verse I think that really sticks in people's heads and gets them kind of mixed up and say, well, wait a minute. If men, you know, it says fire, that must, that's obviously talking about hell. Is it? Does that line up with everything else that we saw in the scripture? Because I'll tell you what, it doesn't line up. If, if this is talking about salvation, if that's talking about hell, then you believe in, then you have to believe in a works-based salvation which I already said earlier, and I'm not going to go through all the trouble, of, like Ephesians 2, 8, 9, for by grace you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves is the gift of God, not of works, as any man should boast. There's so many, there's so many references in the Bible that you could disprove works salvation very easily without a shadow of a doubt. But it's, this, it's these, these single passages that people like to turn to, and they're always parables. When someone comes up with a doctrine and they want to prove something to you, if they can't come to you with, with, with clear doctrine and clear scripture and it's always some kind of a parable, I don't buy it and you shouldn't buy it because you need to have clear verses. And this one, people get messed up. Now, in our physical illustration, this makes perfect sense, right? If you're not bearing fruit, well, guess what? Here's a dead branch. Here's a branch that we're not going to eat anymore. What are we going to do with that branch anymore? We're going to burn it, right? They didn't have... This, the trash collection like we have today where you put your garbage out in the front and a big truck comes by and they haul it off to the dump, right? I mean, all throughout history, people typically would burn their trash or bury it somewhere outside. But, I mean, the, the most likely thing you would do with pieces of, of a branch or a vine or whatever, you're going to burn it. And that's exactly what you would do here with, with something that's useless, something that's worthless. So if you're not doing what God wants you to do on this earth. You, God's got a plan for you. God wants you to bear fruit. God wants you to do all this stuff. Well, you don't do anything. You're not doing any good work for him. You, you, you end up just kind of being useless and just taking up space and maybe even doing things to harm the cause of Christ, right? I mean, some of these branches that, that need to be pruned, they need to be pruned because they're in the way. 
right? You've got something, some fruit over here that's producing, but it's not going to be able to produce very much because this other, these other branches are cluttering up the space and it just doesn't have any more room to grow. So these ones that are cluttering up the space are actually doing damage since they're not also, if they're bringing forth fruit, you'd say, okay, well, we've got, we've got two areas here. They're growing fruit, they're right next to each other, but hey, they're both, they're both producing fruit. You're not going to take one away because they're both doing something good. But the one that's useless, you're going to get rid of that to, to make room for, for other fruit to grow. And when you're not following Christ and do what he wants you to do, you're actually har harming the cause of Christ. The, Jesus said, He that is not with me is against me. And he that gathereth not scattereth abroad. He said, if you're not gathering, if you're not going and doing the work and bringing things in, you're actually scattering. You're actually doing the opposite of what you're, of, of what you're doing. You're not just neutral. Nobody's neutral in this game. If you're not actually going out and doing the work, you're actually doing harm. And that's why he gives up this example of, of you know, what do men do with it? Well, they get rid of it. They toss it. They burn it. It's good for nothing. Like Paul said, that I might be, a, that I myself might not be a castaway, right? Just useless, castaway, good for nothing. God can extinguish our life in a heartbeat. Um, you look at Ananias and Sapphira in Acts 4, I believe, and they were, um, they brought forth, you know, and, and I believe they were saved. I believe they were Christians. The Bible says they gave up the ghost, but, um, they were smitten dead for, for lying to the Holy Ghost. I mean, they sinned. They did something. God says, like, look, this isn't a game. This isn't a joke. You're not doing this just to be seen of men. And they lost their lives. Now, if they were saved, of course they went to heaven. People say, oh, well, that's, you know, that's not a punishment because they got to go to heaven. Not quite. I mean, it, it, it still is a punishment because you lose your ability then to, to, to gain and earn rewards for yourself in heaven. That... That, in a way, is, I mean, obviously, if you're saved, it has nothing to do with your works. So that's going to happen no matter what. So, you, you know, there is, a, there is a penalty depending on the way it happens if you lose your life early. Not always. I'm not saying that's always the case, that it's always a penalty. I mean, you look at the apostles, you look, or you look at Stephen, who was martyred. I'm sure that wasn't a penalty for him to lose his life early. I think he's earned plenty of rewards just in being martyred for Christ and, and the great testimony and work that he did. God chose that, that, that his work was done at that, you know, in that, that particular time frame. But for people who are out of God's will and not doing what God wants them to do and their life ends up early, like if I were to just turn to drinking and drugs and overdose or something, yeah, that's, that, you know, I'm still going to go to heaven because I've, my soul's been saved. But I'm going to lose out on all of my opportunities to actually earn rewards for myself in heaven. I mean, it's all gone. And to reach others and to affect other people and do, you know, just do all these good things, you lose out on that ability. Um, so that, this is what he's talking about here. And it's, very, it's, it's the most simple surface explanation for this parable. And, it, and it's obvious that that's what he's talking about. Um, I, I don't think it's, it's anything that should be too difficult for people to understand. But like I said, you know, oftentimes what happens too is when people have these false doctrines, They've got a way of, of performing their, their mental acrobats and leading you from point to point. And sometimes you don't always pick up on where is their, where is their, fall, their, their flaw. Because it's normally right at the beginning. Normally what happens is you're, you, they're flawed right from the start and then they lead you on this path that, that logically makes sense from one point to the next because they've started off going in the wrong direction. Um, and that's typically how it works with this. But when you compare Scripture with Scripture, as I just did tonight, and we see, you know, uh, being one of Christ's disciples, how that's based on your works. And he says, even here, if you bear much fruit, you're my disciples. And the whole point of being in Christ and abiding in Him is to bear more fruit. It's all talking about our works. It's all talking about our Christian life and the good things that we can do to be fruitful for God. But let's move on from that. Um, well, one more point. Turn... No, 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 no. We've got to move on from that. Matthew 7, 18 says, A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. That's what I was going to turn to and read that more in context. But, again, just to clarify what fruit is, and, you know, if, you're a, if you are a branch on this vine, 
if you're going to produce fruit, the only fruit that you would ever produce, like in this example, would be grapes, right? This, this exact fruit. Because that's what this vine is bringing forth. And that's all it's going to bring forth. And if you're in Christ, that vine, that root, that's, that's a good tree. All you're going to be capable of doing is bringing forth that good fruit if that's where you're at. But if you're not, if you're of a different tree, if you're of a different father, like Jesus said, you're not of your father. You know, the, the Pharisees were trying to say that they were of their father Abraham. He says, if you were of your father Abraham, you do the works of Abraham. You're not of your father Abraham because you're of your father the devil. And the devil is a liar and the father of it. And, you know, basically he's saying, you do the works of the devil. The, mur the devil is a murderer from the beginning. And they were going about to seek Jesus to kill him, just like their fathers had killed the prophets. They were children of the devil. They were bringing forth fruit after their father, the devil, not after their father, Abraham, or God, or whatever, um, as they were claiming. Good trees bring forth good fruit. Just because, just because you have a, a branch in a good tree that's not bringing forth fruit doesn't mean it's not part of that good tree. Right? So, um, anyways, I'm going to move on from that. I spent quite a bit of time, and I knew I was going to, but it's important to understand that it's a very, very common um, scripture, and, and it's very power, powerful, too. I mean, there's a lot of great truth there. But let's keep going here. Let's go to um, verse number 9. Well, verse number eight, he says, Herein is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit, so shall you be my disciples. You want to glorify God? Bear much fruit. Do the things God wants you to do. Be, be fruitful and multiply. Preach the gospel. That will bring glory unto God. Verse number nine, As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love. Even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. These things have I spoken unto you that my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. Now, you want God to love you? You want God to be happy with you? It's very simple what He's saying here. Keep His commandments. And this is what all the, none of the liberal churches seem to get. They'll look at us and say, oh, you're such a legalist. Oh, why are you always preaching on God's laws and God's commandments? You know, why do you focus so much on that? Because I want God to be happy with me. That's why. Because I want him to love me. As Jesus Christ just said in John chapter 15. That's why I focus on it so much. He says, if you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love. I want to abide in Jesus' love. I want him to love me. So I'm going to keep his commandments. He says, even as I have kept my Father's commandments. Did Jesus Christ ever sin? No. Why did he not sin? Because he kept his Father's commandments. Christians, don't think that Jesus Christ came to destroy the law. He came not to destroy, but to fulfill. He didn't destroy the law. He destroyed the curse of the law for those that put their faith on him. But the law still exists and we ought to obey those commandments in order to be pleasing in the Father's sight. That's how we're going to have God's love and God's blessing upon us. And that's why he says, look, it says, These things have I spoken unto you that my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. Obeying God's commandments is something that brings joy. And to those who decide to just forsake God's commandments and God's laws and think they're not really that important, they don't really know joy. They don't understand the joy and the happiness that you get from God's law and from keeping God's law. And David knew this very well. Psalm 1.1 says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law doth he meditate day and night. You want to be happy? Do you want God to love you? you want things to go well in your life? And, and to be fruitful and to have joy and just live a happy existence? Make your meditation in God's laws. Delight in God's laws. Be happy about them. Be happy that God has given us these commandments and guidance and instruction on how we ought to live our life. Because if we listen to Him, hey, as a loving Father, He wants you to do what's right. I want my children to... Do you think I like when my children are sad and upset and they're cry and miserable and go through sorrow and pain and all these other things? 
Of course not. Well, that's why I have certain rules for them. I don't want my one-year-old to stand up on the table. Why? Is it because I'm a mean jerk and I don't want her to just have fun and be free and do whatever she wants? No, it's because I don't want her falling and landing on her head because I don't like seeing her in pain. So I have a rule that, she likes breaking those rules too, by the way, but I have a rule for the purpose of her benefit. Just like all of my rules for all of my children, it's for their benefit. Rules on what they need to eat, how much they're going to eat for dinner, the nutrition that they receive. It's for their benefit. I don't want them getting sick. I don't want them experiencing the, these, these painful things in their life because I love them. God's the same way. He gives us these rules and they're simple rules. And he says, look, I don't want you to have to deal with the consequences that come with adultery and with fornication and the disease and the wickedness and the, and the hurt and the heartache and, and all that goes along with that and the problems that you get by going and, and committing these sinful acts. I don't want you to do them, so I'm going to tell you no. Don't do it. Because he loves you. If we could realize that, instead of saying, ah, oh, you're such a legalist. I am. I am a legalist. If that means try, I, I love God's law, as David said, and I want to meditate it day and night and just do what God has told us to do, then call me a legalist. That's fine with me. Actually, I'll delight in that term. As long as you don't mean being a legalist to be saved, as in obeying all the commands to be saved. I don't believe that. But if you want to call me a legalist for trying to follow to the letter God's laws for us, then fine. Because Jesus Christ said, that's how I'm going to get joy. And that's what makes the Father happy. Psalm 40, verse 8 says, I delight to do thy will, O my God. Yea, thy law is within my heart. Psalm 119, 77 says, Let thy tender mercies come unto me that I may live, for thy law is my delight. David delighted in the law of God. We ought to delight in the law of God too. Because God is looking out for us and God wants us to have joy. That's how we're going to get that. Let's keep reading here in John uh, 15. We're going to have to, I'm going to have to blow through a lot of this a little bit quicker. Um, verse number 12. This is my commandment that ye love one another as I have loved you. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. So Jesus is telling us that we, you know, we ought to love one another. We should. We need to be ministers. We need to, we need to care for other people in the church as I have loved you. As Jesus Christ loved us, and we saw the example he gave earlier in the book of John where he washed the disciples' feet, and he did this for an example. Jesus said lots of things that are examples unto us that we, can, that we should love other people the way that he did. And he says there's no greater love than someone laying down his life for his friends. And that's exactly what Jesus Christ did for us. He laid down his life for us. It says, for his friends. And he calls them his friends. He calls us his friends. Verse 14, he says, ye are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. I, I, I kind of like that, that, um, that verse. Ye are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. Because that's not the way that we always think about friends today. Like, hey, Brother Sebastian, you know, I'll be your friend if you do everything I tell you to do. <laughs> That's not the way to think about it. But, but for Jesus, that's what he says. He says, look, if you, do, if you do the things I command you to do, then are ye my friends. And what did he just command them to do? To love one another. That's what he's saying here. So it's not, you know, <laughs> it's not like you're my slave, that's why you're my friend. That's not what he's saying here. He just says, this is my commandment that you love one another. So he's saying, look, if you love one another as I have loved you, you're my friend. Right? Then are you friends if you do whatsoever I command you. You're my friends because you love other people the way that I love them too. And, and in order to be friends with someone, you ought to love them. You ought to do things for them. He says in verse 15, Henceforth I call you not servants. For the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth. But I have called you friends. For all things that I have heard of my Father... I have made known unto you. So he's saying you're not just servants. Servants, you know, servants do what the boss tells them to do because the boss tells them to do it. And the boss doesn't always have to explain why he's telling a servant to go do something. My boss at work, when he gives me a task to do, he doesn't always have to explain and be like, okay, Dave, this is why I'm giving you this job because the no. He's the boss. He just he says to do it, then I'm gonna do it, right? I mean that's the way it works with servants. But but Jesus says, okay, this isn't the way it is with me and you. Because I'm also telling you, but I'm, I'm explaining it to you. He says, 
For all things that I have heard of my Father, I have made known unto you. You know what else I get from this? A true friend, someone who is a friend, you're not going to hold back God's word from them. You're not going to hold back the Bible from them. If you, if you truly are somebody's friend, you're not going to hold back God's word from them. Jesus says, you're truly my friends because I have told you everything that I have heard from everything. He didn't hold anything back. He didn't say, oh, wow, well, uh, this is kind of negative. I don't want you to hear about this. And if you have friends that aren't saved and you don't tell them about the gospel of Jesus Christ, you don't tell them about God's word, you're holding back that truth from them, you're not really their friend. That's the bottom line. And that's what we could learn from this scripture here. They're more like your servants. Because you don't love them enough to tell them the truth, to tell them everything that the Father hath said. That's what makes a true friend. Let's keep reading here. Verse number 16. You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit. Again, he's talking about bringing forth fruit and that your fruit should remain, that whatsoever you shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it to you. Again, here's a, a likening to the prayer and receiving things from God. If you're fruitful, if you're living in his word, if you're abiding in it, if you're doing what's right, whatever you ask in Jesus' name, he's going to give it to you. When you're living and doing what's right, God's ears are wide open unto your prayers. And that's, that is great news to know. And another, another reason to, to, to do what's right and to be motivated to do more for God and to, to win souls. Let's keep reading here. Um, trying to make it through this as quick as possible. We're almost done. He says, verse 17, These things I command you that ye love one another. If the world hate you, ye know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love his own. But because ye are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. Remember the word that I said unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my saying, they will keep yours also. Great section of scripture. I don't even have enough time to really fully develop this point, but great knowledge here. Talking about the world. He's saying, look, you're not of the world. Look, there's, there's two concepts. There's, there's of the Father and there's of the world. There's, there's things that come from God and then everything else comes from the world. And he's saying, you are not of the world. You're not born, like you're not from, you're not of the world. You're from me. And the world is at odds with God. They're separate because Satan is the ruler of this world. And, and the, the world is in darkness. Jesus Christ came as a light to bring light to a dark world. But as long as the world exists the way it is, the world is going to be at enmity with God. Um, so, when you see someone, especially a preacher, this, is, this will, will tip your hand, tip their hand, any false prophet, if you're, if you're not sure, is this person a false prophet or not? Well, if they're really famous, and the whole world loves them, and the president's inviting them to give prayers, and, you know, all of this stuff is happening, and it's just a, a total friend of the world, and, you know, the Pope invites them over, and, you know, they're welcome anywhere, they could go on any TV show, and they're not offending anybody, that's a false prophet. That's someone who's of the world, because if the world loves you, you that just shows that you're of the world. That shows you're not of the Father, because... What did the world do to Jesus? They hated Jesus. Not only did they hate him, they killed him. They crucified him on the cross. They hung him up and put him to a torturous, hateful death. They spit on him and whipped him and beat him up. That's how the world thinks about Jesus and that's how the world thinks about God. And he's saying, are you better than me? Is the servant greater than his master? If you're my servant... Do you think all of a sudden now, if they treated me this way, that all of a sudden you're going to be well respected and you're going to be loved of the world and still think that you're of the Father? If that's how they treated the most pure, perfect man to ever walk this earth? The most righteous man, God in the flesh, Jesus Christ? If that's how they treated him, do you think that you can do better? Well, if the world loves you, you must think that, but you're not of, you're not of the Father then.
You're not of God if the entire world loves you. And that is, that is the truth. And that's what, the, that's what he's saying right here. He said, don't think you're better than me. But it's also a warning too. Um, uh, so that we can be prepared for it. So that we can know, hey, when, you start, when the world starts hating on you and you start going through the persecutions, just know that that's exactly what they did to Jesus. You're in good company. And don't expect any different. We ought to expect those trials and those persecutions to come. It doesn't mean it's going to be there every single day of your life. It wasn't there every single day of Jesus' life. He did all kinds of things where, you know, he wasn't. But, but his persecution was very hard. And he, he faced a lot of persecution all the time because he was doing so much good work. But I'm sure, that, I mean, there are times when he spent with his disciples alone or whatever. It doesn't mean your entire life is going to be one big persecution, but um, they will come. And you will never, just get this through your head, if you're a Christian, you want to follow Christ, you are never going to be loved by the world. Sorry. So you can just, just cross that off your list if that was one of your goals. But let's keep reading here. We're almost done. Um... I was going to read. For more information on loving not the world or things there in the world, turn to 1 John chapter 2 um, later on. But we're going, to, we're going to wrap up this sermon right now because we're just about out of time. But um, where did we leave off here? Verse number... Yeah. 21 maybe. But all these things will they do unto you for my name's sake because they know not him that sent me, saying, they're going to persecute you because they don't know the Father. He said, if I had not come and spoken unto them, they had not had sin, but now they have no cloak for their sin. He that hateth me hateth my Father also. If I had not done among them the works which none other man did, they had not had sin. But now have they both seen and hated both me and my Father. He's saying, look, because he, he was coming as the Christ. He was coming as Jesus. He says, you know, if they hated me, but I wasn't doing the works that no man has ever done, if I wasn't making it obvious, if I wasn't making it clear, you know, if I hadn't spoken unto them, if I haven't given the word of God, if I hadn't performed all these miracles, then you say, okay, I could see how they wouldn't, wouldn't have sinned. But that wasn't the case. He says, I did perform all these miracles. I did miracles that no man has ever done. I've done the work that, that is obvious and apparent from God and I've, get, I've, I've spoken to them the word of God but they still hated me. And he says, um, and he that hated me hated my father also. You see, they think they love the father but hate Jesus. That's not true. Once they hate Jesus, they hate the father also. Um, verse 25, but this cometh to pass that the word might be fulfilled that is written in their law. They hated me without a cause. But when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me. And ye also shall bear witness, because ye have been with me from the beginning. So he's explaining when this is all said and done, when he's gone, when he's crucified, when he's, when he's resurrected from the dead, he says that the Comforter is going to come. And, um, and the Comforter is going to bear witness. The Holy Ghost bears witness of Jesus Christ. And he says, you also are going to bear witness of me because you've been with me from the beginning. They've seen all the miracles. They've seen everything that he did. They know the word of God and they're going to go and preach with the Holy Spirit unto others. And that's why people today still don't have excuse when they hear about Jesus Christ and um, from someone with the Spirit of God testifying of Jesus Christ and, and the miracles and the works that he's done. But um, let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your words. God, I pray that you would please help us never to be mixed up in false doctrine, not to, to base an entire doctrine off of one or two parables, dear Lord, but that we would look closely to the, to the clear statements that you make, because there's plenty of them, dear Lord, and, and let it help us to understand the parables in light of your true, um, well, not just true, but the, your clear statements that you give us in the Bible, dear Lord, and help us to to understand these parables and not to let other people get us confused or mixed up. And Lord, um, we pray that you would also just help us to, to walk in your commandments, to know your commandments. Lord, help us to, to, to be stirred up in spirit to, 
listen to your words, to, to obey them, to meditate on your law day and night, and to, to understand and receive the, the full joy that we get and the peace in our hearts that we receive from knowing that we're doing right by you and just, and just living a life totally of faith and in full assurance that you're looking out for us, that you're hearing us, and, um, and that you love us because of our walk with you and because we're abiding in Christ, dear Lord. And I pray that you please help us to achieve this. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Mm -hmm.